Well, we're so glad you're here tonight. Um, I'm glad we all survived the storm of the century last Wednesday night. We made it here. I saw the clouds coming today. I was like, not again. Not again. Um, but uh, man, we're, we're excited to continue on tonight in conversations about God's design for sexuality. How many are thankful that God made sex? It's a good thing. Yes, you can amen to that. Um, and uh, he's got a, a, a purpose in it. He's got a way in it. And it's something that the church, we need to be talking about. We need to be um, just filling ourselves with the truth of his word in and, and leaning into him on this. And so tonight we have a special treat in that Jeremy Williamson is in the house. And uh, some of you may or may not know Jeremy, but he's a part of our our church, he and his wife and their family, and uh, he's been a pastor, he's a counselor, um, and he's just a real gift, and he, he has such a heart in, uh, to, to speak into this realm of sexuality, and so he's going to share for a while, and then we actually have a panel after him, so it's going to be a, a, a power-packed 60 minutes. Are you ready for this? All right. Could we give Jeremy a big warm welcome as he comes tonight? Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Wow, welcome. Here we go. And this is, you know, the topic of sexuality and gender and, and who we are and how we bring ourselves into the world. <clears throat> it is, those are deep waters. Those are deep waters. You know, when we, I have three teenagers in my house right now. And when, when it comes time to have like the talk with them, it's so funny because many of us, well, first of all, many of us didn't have the talk when we were growing up, but now that we're trying to do better and give it to our kids, it's like, we kind of focus on the mechanics and like, wait till you're married and try to get it over as fast as possible, and we we really lose, I think, most of the time when we talk about sex and when we talk about gender, we talk about who we are and how we bring ourselves into the world, we miss out on so much of the richness and the depth and the goodness that is a part of the design and the image of God. You see, when we talk about sexuality and we talk about our gender, we're talking about glory and passion and delight and mystery. We're also talking about, we're swimming in waters where there is shame and sometimes addiction and woundedness. And so I, I just want to name actually tonight because I'm in a room full of sexual people. Is that weird? <laughs> it's true though. Um, I just want to invite you all like take a deep breath with me. Be here. <sighs> Because I, I'm aware that tonight we are talking about a subject where there is mystery and there is delight and there is goodness and there is shame and there is brokenness and there is loss and there's addiction. And so let's just be and let's just get into this together and see where God wants to take us. Is that okay? We are at the beginning of this, and you'll hear this over and over again throughout this whole series. Josh started with it, Aaron picked it back up. You'll hear this over and over again that we are the craftsmanship of God, that we have been made in the image of God, and that includes our sexuality. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul writes that, for we are the craftsmanship, the workmanship of God, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that, that verse and even the language that is used in Greek in that verse, it's like this beautiful phrase that says, you are the artistry, the craftsmanship, the poetry, the beautiful reflection of the nature of God. And that includes every part of you. It includes your body. It includes your gender. It includes your sexuality. It includes every bit of you is an expression of the goodness and the 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 beauty of our great God. And God decided at the very beginning, we read in Genesis chapter 1, that he would create man in his own image, Genesis 127 says. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. 
And I'll tell you, getting into this, it is so good to imagine the design of God for us as a masterpiece. And I'm aware that we live in a broken world where there's sin and there's loss and Sometimes our bodies don't function the way that they're supposed to because of the brokenness of of earth and the degeneration of our flesh. But the idea that God would take his own nature and that he would invest a part of his nature into this creature called male man and that he would take another part of his nature and invest it into another kind of person called female, called woman, It's so good. It's so cool. I mean, just a few weeks ago at home, my daughter, who's 17, she was getting ready for prom. And she took all day to get ready for prom. And you guys, she's my first one, and I had no idea that prom dresses cost that much. (laughs) If you don't know yet, just wait. It's crazy. It's really crazy. So she's taking all day to get ready. She's got all these friends coming over to the house. It's like... Girls are coming in. They're getting their eyelashes put on by my daughter. She's doing all their hair. And it's like this crazy thing. And, and she comes upstairs and she is stunning. She's so elegant. I, I just, she took my breath away. She was so lovely. And that same night, while my daughter was away at prom, my sons come running up the back steps into the back into the back door with they both of them had a friend over so these four boys they all have their shirts off they had been out in the pond and they were holding frog's legs that they had harvested and cut off and skinned and were asking if they could cook them and then my son Gabriel goes dad do you want to talk to my parrot and I'm like your parrot and I look at his shoulder and he has all the frog's guts hanging off of his shoulder. He's like, yeah, it's my parrot. And I was like, okay. Okay. So that night, my daughter had so much fun being lovely. It was so wonderful for her to embody her femininity. And my sons were having so much fun being boys. There is so much goodness in the design of God and the way that it is expressed in our gender. And so I want you to know your masculinity and your femininity, first and foremost, they are a masterpiece. And so ladies, your tenderness and your wisdom and your fierceness I said that once in a group of, in a group of dads, and a, a dad stopped me, and he was like, I don't know if I like you calling my daughter fierce. I don't think fierce is a good description for women. And I'm like, were, <laughs> were you there when your wife gave birth to your, to your daughter? <laughs> okay, settled. Your fierceness, your loveliness, such a gift. Your long-suffering your resourcefulness, your faithfulness, the way you nurture, the way you're soft. You know, some of my best buddies when I was real young were girls, super fun, silly, so fun to play with. I love the silliness and the funness that lives in women, your bravery, your emotional availability. Wow. And men, our strength and our ferocity, our kindness, our tenderness, the way that we can sacrifice ourselves as servants or offer protective leadership as serving as priestly guides and a voice that brings blessing in life. I love our sense, our sense for adventure and risk. And we are partnering with God because there is a very specific reason why he designed us and invested these parts of his nature within us. Because, ladies, you partner with God to bring beauty and life into the world through your fierceness and your loveliness. And, men, we partner with God to bring in his strength and his tenderness to the world because God really wants those things to be evident in the world today. And so if you're here tonight and you were born a female, guess that's so awesome. Welcome, and and listen, you belong in the sisterhood of women, regardless of how you feel about your femininity. 
You belong in the sisterhood of women. I'm so grateful for you. And if you're here tonight and you were born a male, that is also awesome. You belong in the brotherhood of men. Welcome. And I mean that for all of you. You see, when God created us as male and female, he created two separate categories. And I just quickly, there is not a spectrum and you where there's male on one side and female on the other side and you might exist somewhere on one or the other or in between. But within this really cool thing of being a guy, there, there actually are many ways that different ones of us express the masculinity of God. And within this beautiful thing of being a woman, there are lots of different ways that you express the femininity, the goodness of God. And it is okay. It is okay if you feel like the, my sense of my own masculinity doesn't fully line up with what I think it's supposed to be. And it is okay if you feel like my sense of my own femininity isn't, I would rather go to like a monster truck rally than a tea party. That's okay. Get it, girl. There's room for you. Bro, if you don't hunt elk and chop wood, there's so much room for you. Listen, Jesus wasn't exactly John Wayne either, right? He wasn't. I mean, he was strong. He was a man and he embodied masculinity for sure. There was a fierceness about him. But we need, we need the, the, the tenderness of the mothers and the, the women who, who embody femininity and beauty in that way. And we need, I was just reading about, uh, her name is Jael or Yael, who is a woman in the Old Testament. And it's that lady who like drove the tent peg through the guy's, through the guy's temple, the enemy of God. We need the Deborahs just as much as we need the Marys and the Marthas. And we need the Esthers and we need the Ruths. But I'm going to be honest, sometimes the Ruths and the Esthers get a little bit too much credit because we need the Yales and the Deborahs too. And men, it is okay if you're Peter and you're all huff and puff and masculine or manly, whatever in that way, whatever that means. And it's okay if you're John who tenderly rests your head against Jesus' chest. It's okay. There's room for you. And the whole point, what we're going to talk about tonight as we get into sexuality and we're talking about gender is whatever you got, we need it. Because it is the image of God. And it is, God desires greatly for his image in you to be present on the earth. Evil really wants you to believe that you are unwelcome and broken and isolated. And there's not a person in this room who has not experienced the attack of evil against your sense of your own gender, the sense of your own sexuality. Every single one of us has been attacked in that way because evil hates it. But I want you to know tonight, regardless of how you feel you show up as a man or a woman, every cell in your body, except for your sperm and eggs, is male and female. Every cell. Your mind is male. Your emotions are male, your reproductive system is male, your mind is female, your emotions are female, your reproductive system is female. That is the way that God created you brilliantly as sons and daughters, fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters. And so tonight, I'm inviting you to ditch the lie that you're not enough. And I I really do mean this metaphorically, but we need to drop the fig leaves. Interesting that Adam and Eve covered the parts of their body that were gendered and sexual. That wasn't God's idea. God designed all of you to belong and to exist in the world in these beautiful ways. So God creates us, and then he does this really wild thing. He fills us with desire. So not only do we embody these different parts of the nature and the character of God, but then we are full of desire. And I want you to know desire is not an evil word. Desire is the nature of God. Why else would God have chosen to exist eternally as three people, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, always desiring one another, always loving, always embracing and being embraced, always wanting, always hoping. That is the nature of God and he invested it in us as well. So 
I started off by saying, like, we're in a room full of sexual people. You, this is a room full of people who have an ache, and we are all full of desire. And Jesus, quoting the Old Testament in Matthew chapter 19, said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. They are no longer two separate parts of the image of God, but they are one demonstration fully of the goodness and the glory of God. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Marriage is an opportunity. My sexuality within marriage, it's an opportunity for me to bring all that I am, everything that I am, all of my body, all of me, all of my heart, all of my mind in marriage to another person who happens to demonstrate a different part of the nature of God than I do. And the design of God is that his feminine qualities and his masculine qualities together in marriage come together in just a beautiful representation of who he is. But as we talk about sexuality tonight, we can't escape that God's invitation for us is to bring all of me all of me. Oh, thank you so much. You're the best. <laughs> There's somebody who knows. All right. So I wanna, I, I've got a few pictures I want to put up on the screen really quick. There's, let's just start. Yeah. So God's, God's invitation is for me to bring all of myself. And there's, there's different parts of me. There's like the, the next one shows like my mind. So we've got my thoughts and her thoughts. This is this is where my logic lives, and I, I think differently than my wife does, but this is also where I think about God and I make plans and where she thinks about God and reads his word and studies and, and she thinks about life. So, so there's, there's that part of me, and then there's, of course, my emotions, my heart, which my heart is, is totally male and my wife's heart is totally female and our emotions and the way we experience God, the way that we experience the world. And then, of course, there's like our reproductive system. It's another part of us, male and female. And the invitation of God within marriage, like the, the, the next picture shows, it's just all of us complete. You see, our sexuality is not just about bringing reproductive organs together. Our sexuality is about bringing my whole self, my mind and my emotions and my body, all of me to the person that I have dedicated the rest of my life to. And so when I bring my full person, it is, it is this beautiful representation of the image of God. But as I, as I work with couples, this is typically the stereotype of, of what couples complain about. <laughs> just, just let that sink in for a second. <laughs> so when I talk to a husband and he's complaining about his wife, he says, that's all she brings to the table. She's not interested in this. She has no idea what's going on up in here. And, and, what is, and this is just totally stereotypical, right? Maybe not fair for everybody. But a lot of women will say, he, he doesn't show up emotionally. And I need that more than anything. And so we come into marriage and we... we we withhold parts of ourselves. And for a lot of men, it's easier to just live here and in your sexuality and your reproductive system. And for a lot of women, there's just a depth and beauty emotionally that they, they need and crave and have so much good access to. And so we miss each other. But again, God's invitation is that you would show up. So men who would say, she's not interested in sex, she's just emotional. And women who would say he's only interested in sex and he's not emotionally available. Men, your wife deserves and craves all of you, all of your masculinity. That includes the jumbled, confusing mess of whatever's going on in here. And the same thing is true, wives. Your husband desires all of you. 
And listen, if you're here tonight and you say, like, I, I can't connect emotionally, I don't know how, it feels messy. Listen, you should be curious about that. If you are a man and you find yourself living like that, and that's what you have to offer to your wife, we laugh about it, but it's actually not the design of God. It's an anecdote in our culture to talk about how men and women are, have such a hard time connecting emotionally. And yet, God's design for you is that you and your wife would learn how to connect emotionally. And so my challenge to you, if you want a better sex life, in fact, we're going to get into this in just a second, bring all of you, bring your emotions to the table and be curious about why you can't. Because God designed for you to be able to do that. And women, I would say the same thing. If you say, well, I can't, or whoever, women or men, I can't connect sexually it's hard for me, or I don't want it, or it feels dangerous, or there's just something off. That's okay. Just be curious about that. It's, there's something going on there, and it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you, but it does mean that, that maybe you should be curious about a wound that could be at work, or something that's not working in your relationship. You can be curious, and you can do something about it, but here's something I just want to be clear no one gets to force you to bring what's hard for you to bring. I, I, I'm going to say something that's hard to say in church. I've read 1 Corinthians. I've read Paul's writings about marriage and sexuality. I understand it well. And, and let me just say that, I'm just going to put it like this. Sorry, Josh. Duty sex does not have a place in a godly marriage. It doesn't. I understand that Paul said very clearly, wives do not withhold your bodies from your husband. Your wife does not belong to you, but your husband. Likewise, husbands, your bodies belong to your wives. I have read that. And it, it, is, it is a lack of curiosity and a lack of, of willingness to lean in actually to, the, to your husband or your wife's heart. If we just say, well, my husband wants sex more than I do, so let me just give it to him and just let it happen as if that's my godly duty woman of God, he has so much more for you than that. God has so much more for you in mind than that. And I realized I just stepped into some really deep waters and there's no easy answer. If that's been your story, I just want to invite you to be curious and to lean into your relationship with your husband and to maybe ask, start asking why. And if you need to talk to somebody about that, there's some wonderful people who could help you and your husband find your way or you and your wife find your way through that. So, relationships, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue through this because I really can't wait, to get to the, can't wait to get to the panel. Relationships also happen in seasons. When we bring our whole selves, and you can put that picture back up of our whole selves. You know, there's this, there's this initial phase of our relationship where we're just dating, and those of us who grew up, like, kissing, dating goodbye, or, like... <laughs> Those of us who grew up in that whole, like, I, I, I really want to save myself for marriage. My wife and I both did that. And, uh, man, dating was tough. It was like, bo, 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 bo. okay, I got to go by, right? It's like, get out of here. Thank God my wife, like, the last three months of our engagement, she was in Kansas City and I was in Texas. And it, it was a little bit easier that way. But then you get to, like, the newlywed phase, and the newlywed fit is like, man, I, it's, it's just all that bottom portion, right? It's like, I haven't seen them for weeks. I don't even know who, where they are. I, I, was working with, I was working with somebody years ago, a young man, and he was like, he was newly married. And he was like, he goes, Jeremy, I'm, I just, I'm a little bit concerned. My wife and I have, you know, we've been married for about six months, and we've only been intimate about four or five times a week now, and I'm just nervous something's off. And I'm like, oh, bro, oh, bro. I promise you're good. It's, it's fine. It's fine. So then you get, you get past the honeymoon. You get past the honeymoon, and here's where I wanted to go with this. You get past the honeymoon, and, and all of a sudden... The way you're engaging with your minds and with your emotions, with your hearts, the way you're engaging spiritually matters so much. And I mean that for the longevity of your relationship, for love to last for 60 years, 70 years of marriage, 
you, once you get past that honeymoon phase, you have got to learn how to connect emotionally and spiritually and on a mental level because we're bringing our whole selves. And that continues through kids as our bodies change and we have way less time and way more fatigue through middle age. And listen, once we start getting into like our 40s and our kids are growing up, this is time to like spice it up a little bit. If you've been, if you have been connecting in your heart and you figured out how to connect emotionally and mentally, you both feel like super safe and spiritually connected, then y'all try some new things. I mean, you've been married for 20 years now and it's pretty much been the same the whole time. Like it is, there is a season where your, your bodies are still like good and young and working. And it, that is a wonderful time for you and your spouse to start to experiment and to to be with each other and, and, and find some adventure and spice and freshness in your relationship. And there, there are lots of actually Christian resources, um, great Christian books that can give you some advice on how to do that. Um, so then finally, post kids, our bodies are changing. Sex is not going to happen generally unless that heart and emotional connection, spiritual connection is there. But what an adventure. So really quick. So I want to make sure we have time to go over all the questions. I just want to take a few moments and address the single people in the room. And some of you are single because you once were married and you're not married now. And some of you are single because you're young. And some of you aren't young and you're still single. I, I can only imagine that, that struggle. Um, thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for watching this. It's tough. But I want to say, I don't pity you. I know that that might sound harsh, but I don't think you need me to pity you. I don't think you actually need that because you're, you're, I, listen, over the last couple of hours, I just, I just had the opportunity to sit with a brilliant young woman who is single and her strength and the goodness, the brilliance and the glory of God in her. She doesn't need my pity because she's single and neither do you. You don't become made in the image of God once you're married. You don't become complete once you're married. Like the goodness of God and the glory of God in you already exists. Every single woman in this room, every single woman in this room, you are my sister and you are my mother and you are my daughter. And every man in this room, you are my brother, you are my father, you are my son. You get to continue to bring your gender and bring your desire and bring your ache into the world in a way that we actually need. Single man, we need the masculinity that you carry in your mind and your emotions and your body and even in your sexuality. We need it. It's a gift to us. And the same thing is true for you, single woman. That femininity that you carry in all of you, bring it. Every man is a father. Every man is a brother. Whether you have kids or not, whether you're married or not, every woman is a mother and every woman is a sister. And so you might say, well, like, Jeremy, what about my reproductive system, though? We're going to get into that a little bit tonight in the panel, I think. But I just want you to know, like, there are no trite or easy answers for you. There's tension there. Because your, your physiology, the way that your body works, yeah. It's difficult. But here's what I do know. You are not disqualified because you're single, you're not damaged goods. Your glory, of, the glory of God in you is not diminished. And I am sorry that sometimes the church has not made space for you or welcomed you very well. And I don't mean Hope Church, I mean the church. So hear me clearly, single men and single women. You are not a burden. I know that you ache for a family. And I'm sorry that we haven't done a good job of making space for you and our families. You are not a threat. Your sexuality, your singleness is not a threat. And it's not a burden. Ultimately, we need you. We need what you're bringing. All of you can exist here 
in this family. I just want to finish all of this by saying this. In fact, I want to maybe invite you guys to close your eyes with me. I want to invite you to listen to this question and let this question just sink down to the very bottom of the well inside of you. What do you want? What do you desire? That's a really basic question, but what do you ache for? I think all of us feel ache. We all feel desire, but it's hard to put words to it. St. Augustine famously said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. The psalmist said, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Jesus said the first commandment is that we would love the Lord our God with all our hearts and minds and soul and all of our strength. And second commandment is like it, that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. You guys, what if the God who filled us with desire did it on purpose because he is ultimately the fulfillment of all of our desires? Not your husband or your wife, not sex, not emotional intimacy, but him. What if he is ultimately the desire of our hearts And his invitation to you is to bring your desire, to bring your body, to bring your emotions, to bring your femininity and your masculinity, all of it. Take the fig leaf off. Bring all of you into the relationships that God has gifted you with and especially bring all of you to him. Amen. Amen. All right, let's bring this panel up here. Let's go. The conversation has only started. Can we give Jeremy... A round of applause, thanking him. So good. Guys, we have an amazing panel tonight. We've got Jonathan and Dusty DeStalo here on the panel, Dr. Jonathan. And uh, we've got Alyssa Ferris, who's an amazing uh, part of our young adult uh, crew at Hope. And of course, Aaron and Lauren Edwards. No shouts for them. That's okay. Okay. (laughs) And Jeremy. And so we've got about 29 minutes, which is not a lot of time. Um, And so we're going to jump right in, guys. Thank you for being here and thank you for being uh, willing to to share your heart and your wisdom and all that you carry in this in this subject. Um, So we've we've had a bunch of questions come in from from you all. And we wanted to um, kind of form these nights around questions that you brought. We aren't going to get to all of them, but here's a few of them. And the first one is this. It was a question from a college student. Um, and this was the question, how do I know I'm ready to date someone? Um, is it through relationship with God? Do I need to be at a certain place? How do I know the person I'm dating is the one I'm supposed to marry? Those are big questions. And um, I don't know who's going to have the answer, but one of you is going to have the answer, complete answer to everyone's questions in regards to this. So how do I know I'm ready to date someone? And um, how do I know the person I'm dating is the one I'm supposed to marry, you know? And what level is family and community involved in this decision? Who wants to go on that one? Alyssa. Hey, oh, hey guys. Yeah, um, I'll start. So when we were thinking about this conversation, um, this is so healthy, praise God. But uh, so something that has encouraged me is I had a beautiful grandma um, and she always said, Liz, run as fast as you can towards the Lord and if somebody catches up, just say hi. And that's, somebody, that's something that I say like a lot to friends. Oh, grandma. Friends. She was amazing, guys. She was, she was everything. But um, I've never actually dated somebody before. I've been asked out and I've been in some weird conversations, <laughs> but <laughs> I have been like, you know, that's not it. Like, that's just, that's not it. And so when I think about my life and I think about um, what I'm headed towards, 
my life is, is central around the idea of feasting on the Lord. And so if I have infinite access to the infinite God, I'm feasting at all times. And that is also what I am wanting in my marriage. So two things are going to happen when that day comes. When, whoever the person is, whoever I end up dating or whatever, is one, we're going to celebrate the heck out of that day. Two, it will actually be a collision of his presence. And so when I think about and where my mind is of, okay, how do I know I'm ready to date this person? Is this the person that I foresee being somebody who abides with the Lord at all times and being somebody who feasts on the presence and is the indwelling of his house, of of his spirit? And so, so far, I haven't caught the person yet. So I'm like, just, just chilling. And it's a place of not living in fear of who the person is when that day comes. It's actually a place of confidence in knowing like the Lord has a beautiful way of writing the story and you're actually on an Easter egg hunt the entire time. And if you look at everything as an invitation to get to know the Lord, because it is, whatever tugs your heart, if you sit with him long enough and you allow him to move you through the things, you are actually in the story of the bridegroom and the bride. And so I already live from the posture of that promise. I'm not waiting for that. I mean, I'm waiting for the physical, rep- I don't have a dude yet, so, right? <laughs> but, like, I'm not waiting for the fulfillment of that promise. I'm actually already living in the reality of the promised land. Does that make sense? So, I remember, and I'll be quick with this, is this was like a few years ago, I saw something play out in front of me and I went home and I wept and I was like, what is happening? And it had really nothing to do with like a man and a woman. It actually had to do with the relationship that I saw with the Lord in that place. And I went home and I wept and I was like, Lord, I just wanna know the groom. I just wanna know the groom, that relationship. And so the Lord started pursuing me in this thing. And so I have been blessed to know the Lord in the pursuit of the bridegroom and the bride already, even though I'm not there, technically, right? But this is the access, and it's immediate access that we actually have available to us of like, I am being pursued by the groom and I know him that way. And he has led me in places that this is where my confidence come from, comes from. And this is the, the position and the authority that I take and that I stand on that I know whoever that person is, they're gonna line up with that. And it's not gonna be just, cause you know, you could go and get somebody any day you wanted to, but I'm not gonna do that. So. Oh, that's so that's good. That. Yeah. Gentlemen, we're taking numbers. I will be interviewing you before you get to meet her. She's so awesome. I'm just kidding. That's kind of the opposite of what we just talked about. but. Uh, anyways, I felt the father rise up in me, like, I'll be interviewing people. Um, how about this, you know, how, to what level is family and community involved in that decision? Anybody want to speak to that? Jeremy? Yeah, when I met my wife, um, she was just a pretty girl working at a coffee shop at church, and um, I prayed a lot about it, and I thought, like, okay, let me take a, a step toward her, just a small te- step toward her. And included my community. I talked to my pastor. I talked to my friends. I talked to my parents. And then at the, just in every step, I was like, guys, am I missing it? Am I blind? I talked to her youth pastor. I was like, does she like throw chairs when she gets mad? Like, I, I, I realized that it was really possible for me to be blinded by my own, uh, uh, like, emotion in that and desire for her. And so I... Um, I felt a lot of peace just including as, as many important members of my community as I could kind of every step along the way. I, I would add, we have young adults and teenagers in our home for, and one of the things I've said to them from the beginning is have lots of friends, have lots of guy friends, have lots of girl friends where there's nothing physical, there's no dating. You get to see so many different ways these people show up in your life. And you can say, oh, I like that trait. I don't like that trait. And then you kind of get to have the idea of what it is you're looking for. As a future spouse, 
um, by building friendships. And then when that t- day comes, or it's that person you maybe narrowed it down, friendship is so vital, because without it, I mean, it's just the foundation of what we have together. So just building those friendships, seeing things without any of the other distractions. So good. And ask your father. Um, (laughs) Okay, here's the second one. What are some ways uh, for those who are single long-term to manage their sexuality? How can the church better support believers in this situation? Um, So... This is uh, this question came in from someone that was single. You know, what are the, what are some ways um, for those who are single, long term, to manage their sexuality? Lisa, you, you said some great things earlier. She can't answer the next question, so go ahead. <laughs> and praise God for that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so when it comes to managing your sexuality. Um, that is a loaded question. And for me, it, it comes back to the idea of, of being one with, with him, with the Lord, feasting on it and knowing like, I may not have, um, we'll just be real, I haven't had sex yet. So the reality is, is the Lord has satisfied me in every single capacity. And when you're thinking about I have a drive or I have whatever, right? And there's ways that you can satisfy that. That is not the design of the Lord. And so when you are feasting on him, your mind is is clear of anything else and it is solely fixated on him and you know that you you lack truly nothing. And so... um, Everything that has to do with pornography, masturbation, or whatever the case may be, it is so self-centered. You are satisfying yourself and you are telling yourself that you're your own master. And that's not the invitation that we have, but it's actually the submission to another person. For me right now, it looks like being yielded and submitted to the Lord. When I'm married, like he has satisfied my sexual desire now. When I'm married, it will be satisfied through the union and what I am into. But it will, it's not the man that satisfies me. It will actually be the man that abides with the Lord and the Lord being in him, him ultimately being the one who satisfies me. So when you're talking about how do I manage my sexuality, if you are feasting on the presence of the Lord and you are being one with him, you have everything that you need and you are totally caught up in the gaze of the Father, and you realize that your soul belongs to your beloved, and that's the, the stance that you have the opportunity and the glory to take into. Um, what was the second part of that question? I don't know, but that was so good. <laughs> Wasn't that so good? I, I feel like even you declaring that breaks off lies that people have been believing, that, that he is not enough. To satisfy. Um, that's so good. Can I just amen that, Joshua? Amen it. Physiologically, your body doesn't need sex. You don't. You, it's a myth that you men especially think, oh, I have to have some kind of release. It's not true. What, what she said is brilliant and, and so well said. I just, and I just wanted to like amen that. with like, And it's true medically too. Don't believe the lie. So. Yeah. On. I think, can I, oh, sorry. Are you going to go again? I was, the last thing I'll say is like, if I believe that, then I believe that my father is not a good father and that he actually, I'm believing a lie that he withholds things from me. And that's not true. So believe who your father is. <laughs> <laughs> Liz is going to be preaching next Sunday. It's going to be so good, right? Yeah. Um, what about, is it unrealistic to hope for marriage? Go ahead. No. This is all that I get to answer to you guys. The rest is up to the experts. So, no, but um, no, it is not. Here's the deal. is That day will come, 
And you are actually invited into a scavenger hunt, an Easter egg hunt with the Lord. So what does it look like to actively engage in hope for this promise? It looks like any promise that you have in your life. And I, there's a passage in Isaiah that actually talks about, you know, the waiting. And that word in the orig- original Hebrew actually means to be intertwined with the Lord. And so to wait for this thing. I'm not spending my entire life being prepared for a marriage. I honestly hate the term, like a season of singleness, because that's not it. You're saying that you're separate, or separate. You're not, you're just a, like, I'm just a person. And when that thing comes alongside, hallelujah. But it's like, I'm just a person. And so, um, to actively engage in hope for marriage looks like asking the Lord, what does that look like how, like, what do you want to talk to me about? He shared things with me that I have held close to my heart, and I believe in that thing, and ultimately, I believe in, in the bridegroom, king. Like, that's, that whole story that we get access to, that's what's going to be modeled in my marriage, and that's what I hope for. It's not like, oh, I hope for this, 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 and this. Those things may be a part of it. However, that's not it. But we're so, like accustomed to not allowing the Lord to like move us through the thing and you just have to be willing to sit with the Lord when something tugs your heart and have him move you through it because it's actually just a place of getting to know him and that's modeled even through this whole idea of waiting for the promise of marriage he'll share things he'll share he'll share secrets with you if you let him do that and it's a good time so good thank you so much she cannot answer this next one how can you maintain the passion in the bedroom? And it says in a long-term relationship, but of course we mean marriage. Um, uh, so how, how, do you, how do you keep the fire? Who wants to go for that? Jonathan? Okay. First I'll say, um, for the men out there who believe they have to lead their marriage, and they should. Alyssa is a woman that doesn't need to be led in the sense of come this way. Alyssa is a woman that needs it to be enhanced with what's already happening, right? So how do you know you find somebody? If that somebody enhances you. If they complete you, that's, that's the wrong, you're asking the wrong question. You're not looking at the right thing. Um, okay. I think I said in the office, you put the kids to bed early. That's one way. Yeah. Yeah. You said now they're teenagers and they stay up later than you. Jeremy said melatonin. (laughs) You just like slip it into their hot chocolate, you know? Benadryl. Uh, sometimes locks on the doors. Um, sometimes, as Jeremy said, just a willingness to try something new. I usually share with couples that I deal with two principles for a fulfilling sexual life and simple principles. If it feels safe to both people, and it feels pleasurable to both people. There's your green light. Um, so it shouldn't favor one person because then that would disqualify the safety or the pleasure of the other. So it should be a mutually agreed upon thing. And, and sexual intimacy is often like um, looked at as the highest prize, but we, we overlook Um, sensuality and nurturing touch. So if I'm only touching my spouse in the bedroom for sexual purpose, I miss all this wonderful opportunity to just put my hand on her shoulder or walk and hold hands. And all those things may not be overtly sexual, but they are nurturing. Um, They are sensual. And that just enhances the sexuality expression, you know, later on. Anybody else? (laughs) 
Dass die. Um, I would also say, you know, as we're married longer and we get into different seasons of life, and you know, um, perimenopause comes to visit. Um, you know, it's actually not boring, husbands. Like your wife changes on a constant, regular. So it's kind of like somebody's new all the time. So just enjoy getting to know her. And things that worked last week is not going to work next week. So, and it's true. That's awesome. You know what you just made me think of? Uh, and I'm sure this is one of the things you talk to couples about all the time. Communicate what you like and what you yeah. don't like. Yeah. Like, don't take away the shame of talking about your sexual relationship and what you would like to try or do or experience together. Uh, communicate. I'll, I'll share on top of that, too. I was just talking with somebody else um, about this that goes along that line. Um, just like Lauren and I, you wouldn't think that we'd like each other because we're sitting very far apart, but, uh, but we make it a regular practice even before we have kids. <laughs> Just calm, calm yourself, all right? Uh, but we make it a regular practice like before we even have a kid and now it's in date nights are, are harder now that with a kid. But that is a regular conversation Every date night, I would say. Now, I mean, we're not doing weekly date nights, but like quarterly date nights. Hey, how are you? Are you satisfied in our sex life? What do you need from me? What do you, like, like what is that? And because we're having the conversation outside of the bedroom. We're having the conversation not when we're like right before we're about to have sex or right after sex. So there's not like this emotional high. It's just like, yeah, here, honestly, like, this is what I would desire more. And this is how you can show up for me more um, or less of this, whatever. And so, yeah, the regular communication, dude. Yeah. Good pillow talk tonight <laughs> before bed, husbands and wives. Um, let, let me also say that yeah. as we get older, I find myself talking to guys a lot about testosterone and how it drops off. And so there is a stigma around desire discrepancy. We usually think about women desiring it less, but there's a lot of guys that desire it less, and there's a lot of um, shame around that too because we think red-blooded, American, me want, you know that. And when that doesn't happen, um, again, it would benefit from conversation. Uh, women aren't the only gender to have body issues. So men have body issues as well. So it benefits from, from talking things through. So good. Here's the next question. In marriage, should sacrificing our own needs for our spouses include physical intimacy? Is withholding sex or having sex when you're not in the mood uh, to be considered a sacrifice? Is it healthy to demand or withhold sex in a marriage? I'll start. Um, <clears throat> I know I had some strong words about this in the talk earlier. And the reason, the reason that, that, that that idea in its basic form is difficult for me is because it lacks curiosity. It's kind of... Here's the thing. A sacrifice is something that you can give when you choose to give it like willingly because of the desire and the love that is in your heart. That is different than saying, I owe my husband or my wife something and I have to give it to them or they'll be unhappy and leave me or they'll go look for it somewhere else. I, my encouragement would be for you, if there's a mismatch in your desire as a couple, be curious about that. Don't settle into, well, that's just how we are, and so I'm going to just let him get what he needs. It's not fair to you, and it's not fair to him, and I just want to believe that God has more for your relationship than that. So get with a counselor like Jonathan and be curious about what might be going on um, in your relationship there. I'm kind of forgetting the question because that was a good, good answer. Um, if you don't mind restating yeah. it. 
Um, should sacrificing our own needs for our spouse include physical intimacy? Um, is withholding sex or having sex when you're not in the mood to be considered a sacrifice? Um, is it healthy to demand or withhold sex in a marriage? Um, so, just like Jeremy said, there's a lot of context there that I would need that's missing in the question. But let me come at it from this angle. Uh, this may be one of the more controversial things of the night, but if you're only showing up sexually when you feel like it, I think that's a mistake as well. Um, that rests too much of the goodness of God in marriage on your feelings, which are very fickle. And so, you know, it's not uncommon for me to hear couples just ride that way. I don't feel like it. And the next thing you know, it's, it's three months later. It's six months later. And the idea of intercourse becomes like climbing Kilimanjaro. It's, it is so, because you've just waited so long for the feeling train to show up to the station that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just a risky thing to pin all of your um, sexual behavior on, onto feelings. I think that's really good. I was just going to say, I know you said that's controversial, but I think when you look at sex as an act of worship, we say all the time, you set your heart in worship even if you don't feel like it, right? You, you set your mind and you set your body um, here at the altar, if you're sitting and you're like, Lord, I'm not feeling it, but I'm here, and I, I'm going to surrender myself. And I think sex is meant to be an act of worship. And so I think there is an element there where if we're only going into it when we feel like it, then I think you are at risk of that. So that's really good. I just want to add that. That's really good. I was thinking, uh, Philippians 2, um, it's not necessarily in the context of... Um, Sexuality, but I think it applies to everything. Um, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Um, I think that that's a big thing in marriage, in sexuality. Like, this isn't just about me, but I'm preferring my wife. And when I'm preferring my wife, everything changes in my life. That could be a song. It rhymed, and I, right? I wanted to say like something that what Jeremy shared and just even some vulnerability from my journey. Um, like there is a story of maybe why you are showing up or not wanting to show up in your desire yeah. or wanting to try different things that might actually be safe for your relationship, but you have not been curious enough to sit with the uncomfortability or the vulnerability even with your spouse to say, well, why does that not feel safe for you? Um, personally, for us, like I've gone through a long journey of sexual abuse as a child and went on um, as a teenager that just didn't know better. It's kind of the stereotypical little girl, you know, that gets exposed at a really young age and just doesn't know better. And if that's your story too, um, then I got married and all of a sudden it's supposed to feel different. And it had been this evil, wicked, sinful, guilt, shame filled thing. And all of a sudden, I was supposed to have um, freedom and I was supposed to have worship, like we were just talking. And this felt like for 20 years, it was a way that separated me from God. And I was trying to lean into Him with my marriage and I couldn't get there. And so sometimes it wasn't necessarily about desire, it was about the things that were blocking and I couldn't. I wasn't ready to deal with those things yet, or I felt too ashamed to know when to talk about that. Do you go to marriage counseling, individual counseling? Um, so for us, there were several years where we really struggled, and that was just my stuff. But you think about the union of these, when you're saying, I'm just a person. I'm just a person, he was a person, and we came into union carrying our own baggage and our own stuff with unhealthy sexuality. Um, and then all of a sudden it was supposed to be this glorious thing. 
Um, and it just wasn't that. And thankfully, we have had a lot of hard conversations. We have gone to counseling, marriage counseling, individual counseling, and it's an ongoing conversation for us um, consistently of, oh, man, I thought I was over that thing. I'm not. Um, and surrendering that to the Lord, too. So more or less, I'm kind of sharing that vulnerability side because I think that there's probably some of you in these seats that have a similar background. And I think that's what Jeremy's saying is get curious about why your desire is not where you want it to be or your spouse, and even from a spouse perspective, instead of being like, oh my gosh, they just don't, you're internalizing everything. They don't think I'm sexy. You know, like it's all about me, but really it could be, there's another story on the other side with your partner. So many layers and dynamics to all of this. We were talking about this before we came in here that, you know, we can say things from the stage in general, but there's very specific situations that would, would um, bring different counsel and wisdom. Does that make sense? Um, and I think that that's really important for us to take, you know, in as we're talking about all of this, that there are, are very different scenarios um, in every situation. This last question, and we just have a couple minutes, um, what are reasonable desires and needs for men and women in marriage um, such as like you have a stronger sex drive than your partner. And I think we've talked, touched on this a little bit, but what is acceptable behavior in the bedroom between a husband and wife? Um, who wants to hit on that real quick? Like in about 60 seconds. Can you sum that up, Jonathan? Doctor? <laughs> so, so I'll just restate, you know, safety and pleasure. Safety and pleasure should be your guardrails. Um, I think you need to understand the difference between a preference and a conviction. Um, and so it shouldn't favor one spouse over the other. There should be both, both voices should matter. Um, again, this is such a, like I'm in my office right now and I'm looking at people. I'm, so I apologize, I'm getting a little bit lost. Could you repeat that? Yeah, no, absolutely. What are reasonable desires and needs for men and women in marriage? Like one spouse has a stronger drive than the other. Okay. Um, and what is acceptable behavior in the bedroom? Okay. So the other thing to consider is that some couples require, some spouses um, would prefer emotional connection first before sexual intimacy. Other spouses get to emotional intimacy through sexual experience. So there's two. And notice, I did not put female on one side or male on the other, because they're just all over the place. Um, so again, just remove the stigma. So I think just understanding that, if you are a spouse that feels closer to your spouse after a sexual act, let that be known. If you're a spouse that would prefer more foreplay or more emotional connection and then be ready for sexual intimacy, let that be known. There has got to be some way to find common ground there. And I'll just revisit the nurturing touch. Don't dismiss that, you know. Um, holding hands, sitting close, rubbing her feet or rubbing his scalp or whatever it happens to be. You know, that's all part of it. If you only look at the sex organs, you're, you're very limited in the buffet that's out there. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Did you have something, Aaron? Well, I mean, I don't want to follow anybody who is, is on this panel talking. These are all amazing. I honestly think I'm just, I'm more on the practical side of things as well. And it goes along with what you're saying there, Jonathan. I think like the, the trap there, and that's not what you're inferring, but the trap is there is like, well, then if I do these things, then this automatically will mean like my wife, for instance, loves her back scratched. It is wrong of me to assume that I'm going to have sex after I scratch her back. <laughs> Correct. That would be manipulation. That's not good. But I also believe... Like, even going back to the previous question and what we're... Like, you want to have amazing sex, pursue each other way outside of the bedroom. And I think it's like, don't be the stereo... I'm going to speak directly to the men, and I'm going to stereotype you too um, as well. So I apologize for that. Um, but, like, don't be that stereotypical ogre that just, like, 
Hey, we went to work all day. We came home. She cooked dinner. She like cleaned up the house. She cooked the kids to bed. And then now it's 930 at night and I want sex. And you didn't participate in anything on what life is together as a husband and a wife. And then there's these expectations of like, like, that's just not fair. And so I would say learn to pursue consistently your spouse, learn to honor them, learn to support them, and you will have amazing sex. So is that too simple? I'm no, it's good. And I want to say something even more simple than that, because I think what I might have heard behind that question is how often should we be having sex? And I don't know that I think that's a that question makes a lot of sense. And I'm not sure, though, that it is it is actually the most helpful question. I think the most helpful question for you to ask yourself and to ask your spouse is, do I have unmet desire? Like, is, is there something that is keeping us within our relationship from coming together in intimacy more than I want to or more than my spouse wants to? Um, is, is, there, is, is our desire being met or is there something keeping us from that? That's when I would encourage you to get curious about what's going on. So good. Has this been helpful? I hope so. I hope so. We're, we're just taking it, you know, a layer at a time. There's so many things to talk about. But, you know, one thing I'd encourage you, um, there's so much that I think was said to those that are single. And I think a lot that was said also to those that are married. And one thing I think you can take here tonight and leave with is um, to begin to have conversations in your marriage. If you haven't been, this is a great opportunity if you've been afraid to, to say, hey, you want to talk about what they talked about tonight? Blame it on them. <laughs> right? Like, hey, maybe we should talk about this. How are you? And I think it'd be amazing if men led the way and said, hey, how, how, how is this area of our life? I want to talk about this and, and, and talk about it and then keep talking about it and um, see what God's going to do. How many are thankful that we can talk about this stuff in the context of church? Yeah. So I just want to pray for us before we go. Um, it's already five after, so if you have kiddos, we ask that you go straight to the kids' department and get them. But I want to pray. Lord, I thank you um, that every good and perfect gift is from above. I thank you, Lord, that um, there is healing. You're even doing work of healing even tonight in this conversation. Um, I pray uh, for, for all of us in this community that everything that we do, whether in word or in deed, we would do it in the name of the Lord. And that even in the realms of sexuality, that, that God, we would please you. That we, our heart would be to please you and offer up our lives in this area, in this capacity, to you as a sacrifice. And that in, in, in all of this, Lord, um, we would do it in your name. I pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Can we give these guys one more hand? Yeah. Bless you. You're dismissed. Have an amazing night.